This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 80. Today, we're going to tackle some listener questions that we've received. Recorded live Wednesday, May 27th, 2015. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. Good morning, Chris Johnson. <laughs> oh my goodness, what a welcome. Yeah, how you doing, buddy? Four cups of coffee, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm talking to the busy mouse and I don't know what I'm doing. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Ah! <laughs> Man, I've had a workout. I've had uh, I've had four cups of coffee. I am good to go. How are you doing this morning? Oh, that's great. I've rolled out of bed, scratched my ass, and I've got a coffee in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I might have done the same, but I just didn't give you that much detail. But uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, no, I joke. Uh, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. I'm um, I'm uh, sitting here in my home office, but I am one cup of coffee in, so it should kick in slowly, and I should uh, I should feel like I'm in the land of the living shortly. So. <laughs> Awesome. How you been lately? Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, good actually. It's um you know, I think last week I mentioned it's nice to get a bit of back to reality after the crazy season of work that I've been through. So it's been nice actually. I've been catching up on things and um we're sort of in my team are kind of in planning for next year because our year runs end of June, starts at the end of June, first of July. So we're getting ready for kicking that off in a month's time or so, and just making sure we're all squared away. So there's a bunch of um, a bunch of catching up on things and, and trying to get ahead on uh, next year. Mm, gotcha. So lots of planning. So I guess so. What is your your year go from July through May, and then you spend all of June figuring out what you're going to do next year? <laughs> you know, like our planning. I'm joking. It, it takes a lo- no, no. You, yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, no, it takes longer than that. So <laughs> it's that. We start budgeting and planning and stuff like that. You know, we started that probably a good month and a half ago or so. So ah. there's a there's a big maybe even more uh, there's a big run up to beginning of the year. So um, it takes a while, but uh, it's going well, and it's nice to be uh, back in the saddle and and um, trying to get back on top of things. Awesome, very cool. How about you? I'm uh, doing good. Actually, I have had a bit of a hard time getting back into the swing of things. Thankfully, I've, I got it in the last day or two. But uh, after going nonstop for two, three weeks, getting content together, all new content together for three conferences in a row, and then doing those three conferences in a row, and having a week at home, and then going out to Dev Intersections uh, earlier last week, and then coming back, I'm just like, I've got a project I'm working on, and I'm trying to get back in the swing of things, and it's all of a sudden like that huge letdown. And it's trying to get that motivation to get going again. So it's a yeah. little, little tough, but got going into it. And um, I'm eagerly watching my inbox while we're recording this because I'm, I've been waiting now for three days and I'm waiting for an email to show up that is highly, highly anticipated. So I'm hoping that you'll, hoping you'll hear me like squeal or something like that during the show. If not, I'll be still sitting there on the edge of my seat waiting for the email to come in for the next few days. If we just hear a donk, donk, it'll just be the mic <laughs> dropping and uh, and you'll be out the door. Yeah. CJ, take over. I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm uh, yeah, eagerly waiting. And I will share with everybody what that email is if it comes in. So it's very exciting. Cool. Personal excitement. but Very exciting. Hey, this show, we haven't. there's something we haven't done in a long time. And um, this is kind of good because after Build and Ignite, there's not much, many announcements coming around the Office 365 and Azure space right now. <laughs> yes, it's taken a little slowdown. It's like it's like uh, it's like people might have you know got it out of their system at the shows and then uh, and uh, and are having a bit of a breather. Exactly. Yeah. So I figured you know hey what we, one thing we haven't done or two things we haven't done is we haven't looked at a, at the reviews that we've gotten for the podcast or done some listener questions and so we opened up iTunes which is really the only place we get reviews. And so we would really appreciate anybody go in and leave a review, uh, leave a rating. Uh, Five-star ratings are obviously appreciated, but um, we'd love to get ratings and reviews uh, in there because it helps kind of drive awareness of the podcast. Most people are finding the podcast through iTunes. And so if you would just jump into iTunes and, and drop a review in. We've got we only have 19 ratings right now, but the average rating is a perfect five star. We got seven, 17 five stars and two four stars. In the US, and that's in the US iTunes uh, that's true. store. Yeah. yeah. And, and it takes a long time to pick 
and change through every country to find them all. So if you have left a review with a question in it or something like that, then email us or drop it into the contact form on our website uh, and point us at it. Tell us which country you left the iTunes review in as well, if you want, and uh, or and you know, paste in your comment there as well, and we'll try to get to it. It's really hard in iTunes to flick through every country's reviews, so apologies if we're missing any. It's not hard; it's just incredibly tedious. Well, that's what I mean, right? It's <laughs> yeah, it takes a long time. Yeah. So hey, we got two reviews here. I want to read one of them out, and then the other one, uh, I'm going to let you review it, review uh, punt it out there because it's uh, it's epic. It's a doozy. Yeah. But hey, we got a review uh, in January actually from Laura SF124. Uh, it says, current cloud news, get it here. Andrew and Chris are a pleasure to listen to and offer great and current perspective on all things cloud. They're always up to speed on what's going on with Azure, AWS, and Google. Definitely check out some of the Azure training on the Microsoft Virtual Academy and watch the data center videos on YouTube. If you're still interested in learning more, you can check out Azure Fridays or Scott Goo's blog. Otherwise, if you have minimal time or can listen to something during a commute, this is your podcast. Thank you very much, wow. Laura. That's pretty cool. That's fa fantastic. Yeah, what a great uh, what a great comment. I'm glad. Um, you know, I love it. I love hearing from people. It kind of makes it all worthwhile, you know. It really does. I mean, when you when you're like at a conference and someone says something, or uh, when you get reviews, it's almost like. I mean, we do this, and there's nobody else listening except for each other and our producer. Or at least that's what our our ba our uh, our perspective is. So it's really good to kind of hear feedback if people are enjoying it. Yeah, I was at um, or not enjoying it. Oh gosh, it was the I can't remember if it was Build or Ignite. Now I think it was Build, and maybe it was Build. Yeah. Anyway, there was some sort of gathering going on, and we we're standing around, and and I was talking to somebody, and this guy comes up and goes, "Hey." Are you the Microsoft Cloud Show guy? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, I don't want to bug you because I know you're talking to somebody, but really good show. I love it. Keep it up. And then he disappeared. And I was like, oh, my goodness, that's really cool. What, that he disappeared? That's that's really cool. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do that in the middle of some conversations. <laughs> no, he was, he was very polite about it, but he just wanted to say hi. And and I was just blown away. I just thought it was really cool. First up, how the hell does he know what I look like? Yeah. And then, uh, but then it was a really nice comment. So that's cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Whoever you were uh, who did that, that was, that was really cool. Cool. Hey, why don't you drop Epic? Uh, epic comment that we got here. All right. So I'll caveat this by saying this is huge. And in terms of amount of words. <laughs> yeah. This is this is more like a novel than a comment. So anybody who really wants the full kahuna and wants to go read this in its entirety uh, should go into iTunes and take a look. We've got to figure out a way to copy paste out of iTunes because this thing is epic. But we have a guy, uh, Joe Spurlock, who wrote in on, via iTunes on January the 26th. His review was titled Unusual Listener, and it's five stars. And i got to say, I read this and I was blown away. So this is kind of long-winded. I've got a few comments out of this that I'm going to uh, read out. This is probably, I'm going to read probably less than, or maybe about 30% of the comment, right? It's pretty long and very detailed. So you should definitely go have a read because it's fascinating. Okay. So with that, hello, I'm probably one of your most unusual or perhaps unexpected followers, a doc. I, I guess he means doctor there. Although admittedly a slightly nerdy one. I came across your show trying to familiarize myself with what's going on with Office 365 and other cloud software slash platform progression strategies and how it can affect my business, which is a hospice organization. I'm the chief medical officer. I'm not sure how in tune with, uh, with this most developers are, but the medical industry is in desperation for a revolution toward something resembling a functional data interoperability structure. And despite how it may seem externally with the recent efforts, those efforts are in many ways a relative failure. We mostly have EMRs, but mostly bad ones. Is that really progress? I'm not sure how aware most are of what a sad state the current the level of sophistication of the average electronic medical record software platform is in this country the bigger the emr vendor the, and the more uh, sorry the more likely they are to be using 20 30 year old architectures under the hood with terrible data silo issues and and I think he means many discrete data entry or data entry is basically completely on the back of the clinical users to serve it up on a silver platter to the EMR so that it can 
process it in a useful way. This is literally killing our productivity as docs. Without a doubt, our only hope of getting good data, big data, and most importantly, interoperable and useful data we can use is to modernize the healthcare industry. Is this revolution to the cloud for apps and core IT infrastructure and eventually personal health information, patient data, content as well? And then he has a whole big thing about the state of the medical industry, riffs into Node.js, into our Node.js uh, topic, amongst other things. But then he also says a little later on, this show has been very helpful, has been very helpful information for even a non-coder like me to understand and get a sense of where we're all headed. It's amazing at how much of my time I've spent trying to translate between medical folks and IT folks and coders over the years to essentially just just to get them to conceptualize what Office 365 is doing to that platform. Anyway, I'm a big fan of the show and the content and particularly your style of speech and interaction and how you manage to put just enough contextual explanation to keep someone like me in the conversation and make it entertaining at the same time. Perhaps my commentary can be validation to you guys like you for how important work like yours is and that it's not just about cool bells and whistles for MS Office software, but it's really about building the infrastructure and platforms that will be the future of our business world that makes the practical application of important yet ailing industries like mine to the next level. Thanks, Joe Spurlock, MD. Wow. <gasps> Epic. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Dr. Joe. Doctor, yes. So there is a lot of detail in here that he talks about um, his take on the medical industry and EMRs and technology behind those and what the cloud can do for it. And I thought it's like, these are the people that we need working on these things. Like why, you know, like it's, I don't know. I I sit back and I see the state of the medical industry in the US in, in shock and awe from what an absolute mess it's in, right? Especially from an IT perspective. And I don't know, I don't know much about it. So imagine what you, <laughs> imagine what it's really like, you know? <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, no kidding. It's, I, I, it's, uh, it, I, I was in the first startup that I, I was involved in was a was in the, the medical field, and it was it was absolutely fascinating. It was it was you learned so much and how much how many challenges there are specifically around IT in, in the medical field and between trying to uh, with the different HIPAA rules and and removing like personal information and then it just it, it's crazy. I mean it's it's like its own. It's a massive topic. It's a massive topic. So it was really cool to get some feedback from someone who is involved in that. They see the challenges in, in terms of trying to translate the different discussions that from the IT guys, from the developers to the actual medical professionals, trying to translate those discussions. I mean, that's a that's not easy. You can't have a dev talking straight to like a medical person and vice versa because, mo well, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush, but it's hard to go through and have those conversations to talk about things in ways that each other are going to understand and having an interpreter between between them, I mean, that's a, it's a unique skill set. So it was yeah. really cool to get that comment, Dr. Joe. I really do appreciate it. And thank you very much. Yeah, incredible. I mean, it goes into things like, he says at one point, Office 365 looks like it can be a big helper in the space as well. For instance, I just recognized that I'm now able to use Moodle and a new Office 365 PowerPoint plugin to essentially replace what we're paying 8,000 bucks a year for. And in addition, we can, of course, develop our own educational content in PowerPoint. And with a single click, I can have that served up essentially in an LMS format. Like, this guy is the future of the medical industry. My God. No kidding. Yeah. But you know, it'd be cool. It'd be cool to actually, it'd be cool to get him on the show and talk to him about his, about the world with uh, like how the cloud's helping their business and stuff. Yeah. That would be a really good idea. Hey, Joe, reach out to us if you're listening to this. We don't have a way to contact you through the through the review. So if you would, go to the blog and uh, go to our site and just drop a comment. Go to the contact form and send a send a comment in. Uh, we'd love to reach out to you and, and talk to you or just send us a message through Twitter at just MS Cloud Show so that we can get in touch with you and we can set something up. We'd love to just kind of just go on a riff and just talk about cloud and how it's impacting the medical industry. And Yeah, that would be it. really cool. Really cool. But anyway, thank you, Joe. Like, what an amazing comment. And uh, if we can figure out how to copy and paste it out of iTunes, we'll stick it in the show notes for the show. Yeah, that's crazy how hard that is. I, the, the, this comment right here shows how bad the iTunes interface is. Not only just copying and pasting it, but I'm reading it as you're trying to read it out. And I'm having trouble following the words uh, just because it's just, it's like tiny font in this yep. huge paragraph. It's just yep. like poorly spaced. Anyway, 
anyway, iTunes sucks. I think we all know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, hey, now that we did a couple of reviews there. Uh, if anybody, again, just to reiterate, if you're, you know, if you if you enjoy the show, if you don't enjoy the show, if you have a comment, I mean, please go just, you know, drop a drop a, a rating in on the show uh, at minimum. And if you also would, if you leave a comment and just, you know, how, what are you enjoying about the show? What do you, would you like to see more of? Let us know. I mean, we, you know, it's, we want to make sure that we're talking about things that not only interest us, but it's also interesting to people who are listening to the show. Yeah, definitely. Hey, let's pivot a bit. Let's do a couple of uh, um, listener questions we've had, or listener comments, I guess. We've had a couple of things that have actually been sent in to us and um, that I thought that we could, we can kind of tackle here. Uh, so one of them, is from uh, someone who we've, we've heard from before, uh, Greg Einberg. And Greg sends a comment and it's got the subject of uh, its idea for a discussion. And what he's, what he's asking here is the um, uh, saying, what about for a discussion topic around what's the transition from a SharePoint developer to an Office 365 developer? Greg says, he'd love to hear from hardcore SharePoint devs who are embracing this fundamental change. Thanks, still loving the show. Well, first, thanks a lot for the comment, Greg. This comment was sent in uh, actually quite a while ago, a couple months ago. But it's funny that I'm, I'm kind of glad we actually sat on it for a while because in the last few months, I've actually talked to a bunch of people at different at a couple of different workshops that I've done uh, between Ignite and Build. Um, and a lot of them are you know, people who are traditional SharePoint developers and they're looking to move to the Office 365 development. I know Scott Hillier and I uh, did a workshop at, at Ignite. So this topic comes up a bunch. I mean, I've got... I guess some pretty some pretty strong opinions on it. Curious to get your take as well, but I guess I'll start out with you know how do people transition? You don't really say how they transition, but what's the transition from SharePoint Dev to Office three sixty five Dev? And I think that first and foremost, and this is you can get thrown at you can things can get thrown at you for saying you drink too much of the Kool Aid or whatever, but really I think that's the way it is that. It's not just Office 365, but across the web, we see that the, the transition is moving more client over HTTP, and it's more work that's happening not within existing platforms, but it's more development that's happening outside of platforms and then talking to these different platforms using different APIs, whether they're REST, whether they're OData uh, flavor REST, or they have like a Swagger interface to them, or if you've got things like using, like in SharePoint, we have the client object model. It, you just have different APIs that you're talking to. And a lot of the authentication is happening over OAuth. And so for me, um, I think that it's not just an Office 365 thing, but it definitely applies to Office 365. And that is the the, the move, moving from working with a very strongly typed server-side API for an existing platform and moving more towards building your own stuff with core platform things and having those those core platform things are going to talk to remote uh, APIs like REST APIs or see some APIs or something and authenticate using OAuth. So like in Office 365, we've got the Office 365 APIs. You've got that touch things like Exchange, touch things like SharePoint. Um, a bunch of stuff was, was announced at, at Build and Ignite about video and Office Graph and um, the Microsoft Graph and all those different things. And it's stuff that you've got to get familiar with with working with these different technologies, but doing it all on a much more kind of an open way and, and, and talking over the line or talking over the wire. So to me, that's the biggest thing you have to learn is just it's mostly core web stuff that you've got to get under your belt. Like Scott Hillier and I did this and there's another there's a blog post by um, uh, someone who's been on the show, Chris O'Brien, uh, SharePointNutsAndBolts.com, where he talked about like the core technologies you need to know as a 365 developer today. And to me, it's things like, I mean, and Chris goes a little bit deeper than I would go, but obviously the, the basic stuff, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you've got to know that stuff. You don't have to be a, a, a hardcore expert at any one of them. Like I can tell you, right, C CSS, I'm a bit of an idiot with it. But you have to understand what you can and could do with each one of these things. And then from there, it's understanding how, how the authentication flows work specifically with OAuth understanding that you need to get an access token and then there's different w ways of getting it, which in the OAuth term, or OAuth world, we call those flows. And then we have things like uh, also getting familiar with how you're dealing with REST. How do you make HTTP calls? How do you process responses? How do you do it both server side? How do you do it client side? That's the core stuff to me. You've really got to get under your belt. We can go a lot of different ways with that. I mean, for me, it's, then it's doing things like with Azure and doing learning uh, not just ASP.NET and C Sharp, but also diving into things like Node or PHP or just really broadening your skill set. Yeah, I would say, you know, from from where I sit, there's the technology shift that you got to make, right? So, like, um, 
like as you said, you know, learning OAuth and learning about REST and learning about the new APIs and things like that. But I think probably more importantly is the mindset shift where, you know, as a, as a hardcore SharePoint developer, we were used to doing things a certain way and we'd see patterns on how to do things, right? So when somebody said, oh, I need a widget over here, you'd be like, oh, that's a piece of cake. That's a full trust web part, right? Or you'd, you'd have these mappings in your head about certain scenarios leading to certain, you know, patterns of design and patterns of solution. I guess solution patterns is probably a better word better way to describe it, right? And I think the hardest part for me that I've seen is like you can learn the technology and any developer can make the switch from full trust code to the to the new web stuff. No problem at all, right? Like that's just a matter of sitting down with some plural site training or what have you and chewing through it, right? But the mindset shift is what I think people struggle with the most. And I and I sort of see this I'm gonna be a little bit tongue in cheek here and a little bit cheeky, but this is kind of like the four stages of rehab, right? And, <laughs> and so, so I looked up here, alcoholrehab.com, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll just call this sharepointrehab.com, and we'll say the four stages of rehab. Okay, so the first stage, I think this is hilarious, right? You And I don't mean this as a slight on anybody that's had to go through alcohol rehab because, you know, I understand that's a, a serious topic, Seriously. right? But the stages are actually quite hilariously similar. So the first stage is, Initiation into treatment. This is when the individual first arrives at rehab. Okay, This could be a time of mixed emotions, and often the addict will still be dealing with the effects of the drugs or alcohol still in their system. That's SharePoint, right? I'm still a fully trusted code project. I'm still a fully trusted code guy. I've still got the jitters about this whole move to the cloud. I'm not sure because it's it's this unknown thing, and I don't get full control over everything I want to do. Um, and by the way, uh, it also says... Some people will be initiated into treatment against their will. Okay, mm, my boss go. is telling me to do it. My company is moving to the cloud, or, or, um, or I need to go get jobs that are three sixty five related, right? So I, I need to learn this stuff, right? So that's initiation into treatment. Then the next stage is early abstinence. Uh, this is where the real work begins. The individual has now committed themselves to go along with the program. This could be a difficult period because of withdrawal symptoms, right? So it's like you're starting to learn a few things and you're like, man, this is just like that whole having to learn stuff is just way harder than doing it the old way, yeah. right? So it's like, man, I just wish I could just go back and have like one more hit of that full trust code, right? Maintaining abstinence is the next phase. Uh, this could be a treacherous period because it involves moving from rehab back to the real world, right? So that's like you've gone through some of the training, now you're having to get on to real jobs, and you know you're having to really stick with it in the hard times, right? So you're you're having to like not fall back into your old ways, and this is the period when most people are at the most risk of a relapse, right? Because when the rubber hits the road, you want to go back to what you know. You can do it as a web part, but you should be doing it as an app part. There you go. There you go. And then advanced recovery is the final one. Once people have been sober more than five years, they will usually have created a comfortable life away from addiction, right? So this is when you get right back into your comfort zone. You're like you know the technology, you know you've relearned the patterns on how to do certain things, and it's much easier to uh, to sort of um, to stay on that path. But the risk of relapse never completely goes away. So we've always hit those situations where it's like, man. Wouldn't this just be easier if I could write a timer job and deploy that? <laughs> you know, we've all had it. Oh, yeah. That was really all I was about to say, you know, that you could always, you know, fall off the horse or the wagon, so to speak. And uh, when the going gets tough, uh, it might get hard to stay on. But, you know, over time, it gets easier and easier. You no longer have to relearn ways of doing things. You've got those new patterns set in your mind and it becomes a lot easier. As you went through that, I was thinking about something else with, with respect to this, and that's I think that a lot of times we see, no offense to, to Microsoft, no offense to your team or anything, I know it's all marketing and everything, but to me, when I see like we're moving from one thing to another one, there's a lot of, here's the why, and it's not so, it's not exactly the thing that you want to have explained like in a recording or on print or something where some tech magazine can pick it up and basically say, look, they basically said that what they did before was wrong. And it's not, I'm not saying that that at all. But mm. what, what I see with this is that, you know, when you look at what we used to do, when you look at the model of where we're going, I mean, I, I've talked to plenty of people that say, I'm not using the app model because I can do more stuff with fully trusted code and blah, blah. And it's like, you know what? I get that. But where we are now, there are very few things that technically you can do 
on-prem or in fully trusted code that you cannot do in the cloud and that you should be looking at it in the sense of, does this make sense of something that we should be doing anyway? Does it make sense that I should go through and create my own custom STS uh, service for doing authentication or my own claim uh, my own claim provider? Or should I be doing things like with, with timer jobs? I would challenge to say, is that are those things a good idea to be doing anyway on your platform or on your environment? Should you instead be looking at this new model? This new model, I mean, you can call it the app model. It's been, Microsoft has called it the app model. I, don't, I think the, the name has kind of gone away now that we have add-ins. But I mean, to me, it's, it's not so much of a new model, I mean, or a new way of doing stuff. I mean, that's just, that's having to give it a name because we have nothing else to call it. It's just the new way of doing work. It's the way that we're supposed to be building stuff. And for those of you who are doing fully trusted code, and for those of you, those of you who are, are saying, I'm not gonna move to this new model, this is not, uh, let me go back to what I was just saying before you before you were just talking about, before you are doing your response. But to me, this is not so much a SharePoint to an Office 365 thing. This is the way that the web is going. This is the way that business yep. is going. And if you don't, if you don't adopt or you don't, you know, buy into something like this, it's not that your job's going to go away, but it's that you're just not staying with where the industry is going. The industry is clearly going in this direction, and they have been doing it for many, many years now. Microsoft yeah. and SharePoint and Office 365 are, in a, in a way, catching up lately going really, really fast with it, this is the kind of mindset that you do want to adopt. The more that I've stepped away from SharePoint, the more that I see so many other people doing this and that the stuff that we're applying in these other technologies and taking it or in other, in other frameworks and platforms and being able to leverage them in 365, it's it, everything is translating and just conceptually. Some of the technology and the bits and bobs are a little bit different, but conceptually, everything translates. This is the way things are going. Yeah, it's, you know, change is always hard, right? Mm. Understand that. But we understand that, but it's where everybody should understand that, right? Not, not humans that, you know, seem to be, but in a vast generalization, averse to, to significant change uh, frequently. To your point about this is where the industry is going, <clears throat> I think we all had our heads buried in the sand around in SharePoint for so long, we didn't see a lot of this going on, or at least paid lip service to it, because we were so buried in like FTC world and 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 things were going a million miles an hour on-prem and it was huge business and, and all that. And, and the world passed us by, you know, and, and now, now we're, we're, we're trying to get back on par to where, to where the rest of the world are at, at least in my view. But in your defense, I mean, as far as when you look at it from a business point of view and as a, I mean, as a shareholder or whatever, you know, you kind of had your heads down, you're focusing on what you're doing and not watching what the rest of the world is going on. You're... Your path was validated. Oh yeah, we had some other we had some other priorities for sure. You had a, well, yeah, I mean, you had a you had a two billion dollar business. You didn't have to look around. And in the last few years, when we've seen Microsoft open up more and more, I mean, we've gotten we've gotten much better things out of Microsoft now that they've opened themselves up more. I mean, now that it's just a we don't care if you're using .NET, we don't care if you're using Windows, we don't care if you're using Visual Studio. We're going to have a solution for everybody. You choose what you want to choose. I mean, I'm, I consider myself a Microsoft developer still, but I'm doing Azure and 365 primarily. I'm doing everything with Node. I'm doing everything on an OS on on a, on a MacBook Pro. I'm using OS X, and now I'm back to Visual Studio because I have Visual Studio Code and absolutely love it. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. So I guess to sum up where we're going with this whole thing, Greg, I think that you know it, it's a, the transition is that to me, it's really adopting the mindset or really trying to open yourself to the mindset of saying client over HTTP for me is number one, and then learning the core technologies around that, and then seeing all the different tools that are out there. You have a much you have much more things at your disposal when you take this approach and not just being force fed of the stuff that whatever Redmond wants to give you. Now you can use anything to talk to them. Yeah, and it, but it's painful to go through, right? Yeah. And so much like, uh, you know, you got to go through the four stages of rehab. Um, but, uh, it, but and there are rocky patches, but, um, you know, and it, it's hard uh, learning new things and, 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 and not falling back to, uh, to like, man, if I could only just use a timer job or, or a piece of FTC code or something like that, but forcing yourself through it, at least in my view, and, you know, I'm not doing this I'm not writing hardcore SharePoint stuff every single day anymore, like you are, AC. So, uh, so you'd know this better than me. But for the most part, I'm I'm digging being able to use 
you know, the latest cool dev tool that comes out from whoever yeah. and playing playing around with it and seeing how we could apply it. So well and just and for the and I mean to Greg and to everybody else out there, I'll tell you firsthand that in the last few months going to conferences like Build and Ignite and having more of these conversations companies and developers are interested in doing this. Before, it was just Microsoft kind of tail wagging the dog and telling us that we should be interested in this. I'm seeing people coming up unprompted, asking more and more about this, saying, I see where I need to be. And hey, let's just throw it out there. There's a ton of money involved in Office 365 right now. And a lot of enterprises have their data up there. It's one of the fastest growing products in the history of the company. So it's a good place to be. Yeah, there's a lot to do. It's a lot to do. Cool. All right, want to do one more question? Yeah, sure. All right, this one's going to be more for you. So we got a question here from Antonio Edward. Antonio says, does Microsoft use Office 365 for their own business? Here's a good, here's a good little twisty through in. And if, and if they do, if they do so, wouldn't it be considered on-prem for them? Ooh, that's deep. <laughs> it's pretty good, right? It's, it's pretty deep. All right. All right, so that seems to be a little bit of a two-parter. Um, so the first part about is, it, does Microsoft use Office 365 internally? Okay, so um, Microsoft uh, historically has hosted all of its Exchange on-prem and SharePoint on-prem for many, many, many years, right? So it had a, it has or had, I should say had, uh, a huge on-prem SharePoint deployment. Multiple farms around the world, Probably one of the largest SharePoint deployments in the world, I would say, if I were to hazard a, hazard a guess. I think there are a couple that would rival rival it in terms of size, but Microsoft is pretty sizable. It was all on-prem, you know, I think over 400,000 sites, like team sites. The way Microsoft organizes SharePoint is anybody can go create a new site collection. So if you want to if you want to spin up a new team, boom, go create a new site collection. It's all self-service site provisioning. You pick the data, you know, you pick the part of the world you want it in, or, or used to pick the part of the world you wanted it in, and answered a few questions, and you could go stand up a site collection. So there was a massive proliferation of these sites, right? And as Office 365 came along, much like you know any company, uh, Microsoft has had to decide how to transition to the cloud. I've been our exchange stuff was obviously first, I believe. And so I think all of our mail is now hosted in 365. I've been on it for a number of years, especially since I came back, when I came back to Microsoft at the at the end of 2011, or at the beginning of 2014? Yeah, March 2014, I think. Yeah, that's yes, right. But yeah, Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, straight into the cloud for exchange. And so that that migration's been going on. I believe they're done with done with all of that now. So all mail is mail is up there. In terms of SharePoint, we have those four hundred thousand team sites or so, but we've also got a whole lot of internal portals. So we've got things like IT Web, HR Web, FinWeb, MS Web. There's all these sort of portals depending on you know what you want to go do. So HR Web is all about HR stuff, and IT Web is all about IT, for example. So there's all of those portals. There's also MS Web, which is our intranet, and then there's all those team sites. And so over the last few, couple of years, those have been being migrated to Office 365. So MS Web is now on Office 365. IT Web, HR Web are all all of those sort of um, functional portals are all up in Office 365. As far as team sites, I I don't believe that they're migrating. I could be completely wrong here. I need to double check my facts, but I don't believe they're migrating all four hundred thousand of those sites to Office three sixty five. I think all new ones are going into the in, into Office three sixty five, um, but then existing ones are staying where they are until they're ready to ready to archive and get rid of over time. I think, I believe, and then each each of the um, different groups around Microsoft is being tasked with moving what they want to move and things like that. So. At a very high level, it goes back to that old adage of just, you know, you don't want to just move everything just for the sake of moving everything. I think it's up to the teams and whether they move them. So um, all of our all of our new team sites, uh, everything that's probably been created in the last year or year and a half or so, I'd say is all in Office 365 around SharePoint. Um, but there are definitely some team sites that still are in those on-prem farms that will disappear over time or be archived off. I don't use any anymore. I use our uh, our Office 365, which makes me think that maybe 
maybe I'm telling a little bit of a fib about moving about moving all of those because I can't believe they've all been new ones. So there may be some some of them that have moved. But so in a nutshell, for all intents and purposes, Microsoft's in the cloud. Like we eat our own stuff. We use Office 365 to run the business across Skype for Business, Exchange, SharePoint. Oh, and um, and Office as well. So we our Office deployments down into our desktop are all Office Pro Plus, which means they get streamed bits down every month. You get like a little box that says click here to update and um, or it'll apply the updates in the background. So we get streamed Office bits and um, our, our mail is in the cloud and our sites are in the cloud. Now, whether that you consider that on-prem or not, that's an interesting question. Like, I would say that's not the case because we're, you know, we're consuming the same service that any business out there on the Office 365 stack would, you know, would be able to get. And so we don't, we don't have some sort of special thing that we just do for Microsoft, which has full trust code turned on, for example, or, you know, I can't deploy full trust code to our team sites or, you know, or put a full trust code web part on a team site or anything like that. We we use, uh, you know, the same stuff that everybody's got access to. So, you know, we own the data centers, so you could argue that that's on-premises, but I would say, yeah, for all intents and purposes, it's it's the same cloud offering that everybody else gets. So I'd say uh, I, I wouldn't call that on-prem. The more you think about this question, I mean, I didn't, I thought it was pretty clear cut what on-prem meant, but it does kind of get a little bit of a gray area because, I mean, technically you own your own data centers, even though you do also resell it. But I mean, it's still, I would, I still wouldn't call that on-prem. No, I don't think on-prem in this, in this, from this question is about who owns the data center. I think like, you know, you could own the data center and we'd be using the exact same service. Okay. So that, yeah, that to me, is it, is it IaaS, PaaS or or SaaS. And that to me, that's what kind of like is the on-prem kind of a thing. I mean, on-prem is mm -hmm. we feed and water the servers. So as a company, you have your own, you go through and you subscribe to Office 365, but as a company, you also provide the services to be able to host Office 365, but it's really two completely different things. Yeah, and it's and it's not like having a core. I mean, I've worked in corporate IT before, where my group was in charge of all you know hosting all the stuff for the rest of the organization. I don't see that as the same thing. I see it two totally different things. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any of the. We don't. We don't. Our Office 365 instance, or whatever you want to call it, we don't benefit from any on-prem pros, and we also don't. We don't have any of the on-prem cons either, right? Whereas we're taking advantage of all the on, on in the cloud benefits and also the in the cloud cons, right? So from that case, I'd definitely stick us in the cloud. Who who runs it is kind of besides the point, you know. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's um it's been an ongoing thing, right? So um, Microsoft started its transition to the cloud many years ago with BPOS and hosted exchange and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's a big company in lots of places around the world, lots of subsidiaries around the world. And so it's taken some time for sure, but we haven't, you know, we don't have some sort of magic to the cloud switch that happened overnight. <laughs> it's just like nobody else has one of those either. No, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big switch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's an interesting discussion, but yeah, I, I would, I would agree. I mean, it's like, here's the thing is that I think that it's smart it's it's good for us as customers. It's good for us to see you guys using Office 365 and to be one of the heaviest demanders of Office 365. And I'm sure a significant number of features are coming out of Office 365 that are based on things that you guys need specifically as a company for the same reason that I fully expect that and, and I think that I we've seen stuff in what they've said is Office or SharePoint 2016, the next on-prem version that's going to come out in the next year ish that when that a lot of the a lot of the things we've seen is are, are a lot of improvements and changes we've seen are coming from Microsoft's role and responsibility of hosting SharePoint for Office yeah. 365 of things that you've learned even though we've been telling even though there's people like me or more I guess it's more like IT pros have told have told you about here's the experience of hosting it here's what's hard here's what's easy here's what we're struggling mm -hmm. with we need you to do this it's one thing to say it it's one thing to hear it it's another thing to be experiencing it and do it and so I think that this is a good thing the pro the product is a much better product because Microsoft is using it so it's a good thing so the one I guess the one caveat to all of this that I'd say um, is that there are 
we so Microsoft for the longest time has had this notion of dog fooding, right? Which is we call it eating our own dog food, right? So that's using our products before they're ready for prime time or before they're finished um, for public consumption. And so I do know that um, that the Microsoft tenant in Office 365 gets things before everybody else um, to make sure that they're of high enough quality and things like that. So like, for example, Skype for Business, right? When Skype for Business came out, we were, we'd were we been transitioned to new service capacity in the cloud before the rest of the Office 365 customers were. And, you know, to iron out any final, you know, kinks, bugs at scale and stuff like that. So we definitely get some updates faster than everybody else in Office 365, um, but it's usually to make sure that people don't suffer from the same uh, <laughs> Same baggage or same problems. Yeah, the flip side of that is you also get the issues first. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, that's the whole point, right? It's to make our, like if if mail goes down for Microsoft, the company basically grinds to a halt, right? And so it's kind of a big deal if they break exchange or break something. It's one thing, this sounds so cynical, but I think that every developer out there and every IT pro out there has experienced something like this to where it's one thing for me to ship updates to a project out and that potentially affect my customer. It's something totally different if I ship an update out and it slams me as a, it slams my company. And it's like, gotta be careful, so. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, right. hey, good stuff. Yeah, it's been uh, been a fun chat. All right, man. Well, I guess until next time, we will uh, see everybody next time. And again, if you would, wouldn't mind just dropping a comment in and we'd love to see some nice comments coming out. Definitely, love a good set of comments. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 file and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us in iTunes by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find a full transcript and show notes of each episode. You can find us on Facebook searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.